Um, the context is this. So if you just put into PubMed um, pulmonary rehabilitation, which is their brand of rehabilitation, for the last five years, we've got 1,000 papers every year. And for the last 20 years, there's been a paper every single day that's appearing. It's a very um, old and historical uh, rehabilitation context. Uh, probably because there's only so much medical development in this type of um, specialty. Uh, and they were embracing rehabilitation uh, in the 70s and 80s and publishing about it at the same time. Um, the summary slide is that there's a huge and very strong evidence base for pulmonary rehabilitation. Uh, that includes the fact that it's a safe intervention. There are tens of thousands of episodes with good safety data, as well as data on clinical effectiveness. Um, in respiratory circles, it's a very inclusive intervention. So predominantly, if people have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, they're welcome, but so too are people with fibrotic lung diseases, people with thoracic cancers, and so forth. Uh, and importantly, it works in real life. So reflecting on Lynn's talk, in the same way, there's real-world data to demonstrate the effectiveness and the impact of pulmonary rehabilitation. Uh, in the UK, there was a survey and an <coughs> audit that's now taking place annually. So across three months, there were 7,500 people who accessed to pulmonary rehabilitation services uh, across 187 different services. And these are the proportions of people who had a meaningful improvement, either in their exercise performance, or a reduction in their symptoms, or an improvement in their health-related quality of life or health status. All patient-centered and patient-oriented outcomes, and all differences that the patient themselves would notice and report back that, yes, this is meaningful. It's a busy slide. Can you see this at the back? <laughs> 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 These are all data from randomised controlled trials of pulmonary rehabilitation, and they're principally taken from two Cochrane systematic reviews. Uh, there's 65 trials in the stable setting, there's 20 trials in the acute setting, when people have had a, a flare-up of their symptoms and come into hospital, and the rehab takes place either there or shortly afterwards. Um, is very conclusive data, and so much so, the Cochrane group, the Airways group of Cochrane, closed down this systematic review, which is a very unusual situation. They're essentially saying with that statement that there, there should be no more trials where we compare pulmonary rehabilitation to usual care. It's not ethical, it's not scientifically valuable to do that. And also, any additional data that comes from those trials won't change our interpretation or our precision of what we can estimate the effects of this intervention to be. It's a very promising and a very strong position. Um, it, it does make you consider when enough is enough. Uh, and we're always happy to point at cardiologists, for example, and say, why did they do these serial trials of the same intervention where they're not really changing their estimate of effect? Uh, but the same, you could argue, might have happened in rehabilitation. And they might have moved on to fine-tuning or looking at changes in rehabilitation programs at an earlier stage to develop the science there uh, more readily. So from those data, there's some quite powerful um, political and governance and guidance um, outcomes that have come from this. This is uh, the value pyramid in COPD, come from the London Respiratory Network or the London Lungs Group. Again, reflecting on Lynn's talk, it's putting rehabilitation in the context of anything we might do and anything we might pay for for people living with COPD. Uh, the message is if you've got COPD, if you've a loved one with COPD, or if you're uh, having COPD yourself, the very best thing you can do, the highest value intervention is to get a flu vaccination every year, uh, and we should all be doing this. The next best thing in terms of cost effectiveness, quality of life and high value intervention is smoking cessation. Uh, it's a political message but it's a real shame this, this is being decommissioned in the UK at the moment for some silly reason. And the next best thing that can happen is for you to be referred to and for you to engage in pulmonary rehabilitation. And look at the quality of uh, the qualies, uh, 2,000 to 8,000 pounds per quality adjusted life year. These are very high value low-cost interventions uh, that our government should be paying for and indeed do, it's commissioned nationally. Compare that to the inhaled therapies in those um, yellow, orange and red bars and uh, telehealth uh, and the current estimates of 
for, for a quality from the telehealth interventions at the moment, albeit lumped into one, is about £100,000 per quality, something that we shouldn't at the moment be commissioning and paying for at scale. From those data, we've also had quality standards and a national audit programme in the UK. So in, in the handout, um, Pat, I've put just the brief outline of the quality standards. It provides a very good structure and framework for people to scale up this intervention. It's giving really good parameters on what it should include, how it should be offered and modelled, uh, how it should be monitored and audited, and lots of uh, very practical prescriptive guidance on how a new service can set up pulmonary rehabilitation and protect its branding, protect its effectiveness. And also the audit programme, uh, it's not just a data collection exercise. Uh, this is giving very useful clinical uh, feedback. For example, uh, there are people who have co cohort programmes where they'll recruit 20 people and those people will do an eight-week programme. And there are others that do rolling programmes and they'll invite people to take part and to join the group as and when they're referred. Now, the wait lists for those rolling programmes is about a third less than the cohort <coughs> programmes. Uh, and there's a strong encouragement from last year's audit programme for people to move towards that if they're not there already. With lots of research, it's also um, important to think back and go back to the definition of pulmonary rehabilitation. And they have successfully packaged and branded this to an extent that it's commissioned in the UK, it's paid for by providers uh, across Europe uh, and some of the states. Uh, there, I've heard there are more pulmonary rehabilitation programmes in the UK than there are in the US in absolute numbers. So the definition is that it's a comprehensive and assessment-based intervention. It includes exercise training, education and behaviour change. And it's about improving the condition that the person has been referred for, but also their health behaviours. And it's about promoting long-term change in health behaviours. Uh, the subtlety is that pulmonary rehabilitation and not self-management, so says this community, would be interdisciplinary and would include supervised exercise. So there are lots there, and it's the sort of definition that you can imagine will come out of a group uh, exercise and a, and a collaborative endeavor, but it can be important. So here's a study uh, that's missing on the figures. The one on the left is the rate of re-hospitalization, and the one on the right is a survival plot. Now this was a very interesting, important study that was conducted from a group in Leicester. Uh, what they were comparing was usual care to early rehabilitation. Uh, this is patients who were admitted to hospital with chronic respiratory disease, and during that hospital stay, essentially had a very structured, focused, and tailored, and purposeful rehabilitation program. Um, there were lots of people in the study, uh, almost 200 in each of the groups, uh, and they were really saying, you know, this is us, we're gonna do it, we're gonna demonstrate this can reduce re-hospitalization and readmission. Uh, it was a negative trial, it didn't do that. Uh, it was a very well-interpreted paper. It's a brilliant read for people who haven't accessed this one. And their very sobering interpretation was that in these acute contexts, especially in the UK when the patient is back home as soon as possible, two or three days in hospital and, and that's that, th what can happen in rehabilitation terms is very light, uh, not least because the patients are very symptomatic and you've only got a couple of days to do anything. Um, and thereafter, what you're doing is not supervised exercise training and is not particularly interdisciplinary. So there are lots of good scientific reasons, and essentially they said at that point, the care should be medically focused. And if we're spending money on rehabilitation, we may as well have a proper go in the pulmonary rehabilitation class once they've had that period of acute recovery. But a lot of the community attention and a lot of the discussion and a lot of the noise was all about the definition. And you can't call this pulmonary rehabilitation. And, well, we don't call this pulmonary rehabilitation. What this is is a very light-touched, unsupervised, home-based, you, you can't damage our brand with this sort of study. So it's important that you get definitions that are workable and agreeable, but it's also important that you stick to them uh, and learn from other data outside of that definition. Um, there's another movement on that stable, strong background of evidence of add-on interventions. What can we do to make it more effective? Uh, and with my colleagues at the Harefield uh, Hospital, which is uh, combined with Brompton and Harefield Trust, uh, one of the things pulmonary rehabilitation doesn't do very well is improve people's physical activity levels. That's a very tricky thing to do. 
uh, everyone can understand that. Um, we had an idea, if you give people some motivational interviewing, if you give them a pedometer, if you give them a targeted uh, intervention, we ask them to improve their step count by 5% each week, uh, we could improve the rehabilitation and we could enhance the effects on physical activity. It didn't work. People enhanced their physical activity as they went through the programme, but then after the programme, everyone had a good sit down, and that's when we made our measurement. <laughs> the other reason it didn't work is because it was a bit of a catch-all, and we were saying, oh, let's just take everyone in the programme. And there are us and 75 other studies who have done the same thing, and they've tried this different range of add-on interventions, but it's been an all-comers approach, and they've taken everyone who's enrolled into the programme. And if the if the inclusion of these add-on interventions isn't cautious and tailored and appropriate to the person, you're not going to demonstrate uh, effects at study level. So a more nuanced, uh, complicated, but actually sensible approach to where you should add-on interventions would be much more considered. And I'd encourage everyone when you move to add-on studies just to be careful and allow it to take twice as long to get the right group of people into the study. Uh, and finally, um, around age-related syndromes. So we and everyone else is interested in uh, frailty. Uh, in COPD, one in four people with a COPD diagnosis are frail, and they present in frailty terms about a decade older than their chronological age. Um, there's a frailty phenotype, which is uh, all things um, bad, and they have worse uh, muscle function, they have lower exercise performance and have an increased symptom burden and more um, dependence on others for activities <coughs> of daily living. Um, and finally, a study we did in frailty, and perhaps some relevance to some ongoing studies, is that we found that indeed one in four patients uh, presented with frailty to rehabilitation, and those patients who were frail had twice the odds of not completing the programme compared to their counterparts. 50% of frail people completed the programme, and 80% of everybody else completed the programme. So there's a very immediate implication for that knowledge that someone is in a, a different group. Uh, but excitingly, um, those people who were frail had the best response to rehabilitation. There's more to gain, and the changes can, can come about much more rapidly. Uh, so much so that at the end of the programme, um, more than half of those frail people were no longer frail by commonly accepted criteria. So there was a good uh, sign there that we could reduce frailty uh, and change the frail state. Thank you.